warning. The following podcast is utter nonsense and may cause agoraphobia, kleptomania, insomnia, and oppositional defiance disorder. We are required by law to provide you with this disclaimer for hazardous materials. Welcome back to Hazardous Materials Slicing Up Freshness. I'm Gideon Gonzalez, and with me as always, Casey Johnson. And uh, this week we're going to be talking about our favorite stories that uh, maybe not have inspired episodes of the new Disney Plus show, What If? But they also got the Watcher in them telling us about stories throughout the multiverse. So, uh, Watcher from a various degrees of good art to bad art. Yeah, you really, as an anthology series, it's always a mixed bag with What If? Mm-hmm. Sometimes you get some of the best comics you've ever read, and uh, sometimes you don't. No. So, uh, Casey... We're going to be counting down our individual top threes going back and forth. So uh, what's your number three? Okay, so all three of mine are from the classic 77 mm-hmm. to 84 series, which is, I think ran about 47 issues. Um, number three is the first one I ever... Well, actually, I wonder if I wanted to do that number three. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to do number three. Um, number three is what if Spider-Man's clone lived? A lot of these what ifs <laughs> turned out to be stuff that... Well, happened. Eventually, editorial is like, we need a new hook. Flip, 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 flip. We got it. So I, I noticed that a lot of things with the writers. It, it seemed like they were uh, grasping onto old what if storylines and turning them into big six issue long epics, like the spider clone thing. But you also had like, what if Jane Foster found the whole, the hammer of Thor, mm-hmm. which had one of the most cringe worthy pages I've ever seen. Check this out, where. Uh, Jane doesn't get the the man she wants, but Odin steps in for the scoop. Macking in on your son's gal. And the next guy. page, boom, married to Odin. That's it. That's the end of the storyline. Way to go, Jane. All right. You know, uh, another one kind of jumps out at me like that is, uh, what if Dr. Doom was a hero? Which makes you go, but he already was. Yeah. I mean, I I, I loved, uh, what was it? Uh, it was an infamous Iron Man. It was... No, it was infamous Iron Man. It was infamous mm-hmm. Iron Man? Okay. I was I getting mixed up with Superior Iron Man, which I loved. Yeah. Except they had no real ending to it at all. A bummer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what if Spider-Man's clone lived? Uh, basically has uh, Peter going unconscious during the fight with his clone. And his clone is still perfectly uh, enraptured with the... Uh, yeah, he's, he still thinks that he's the real Peter. But he keeps talking about you know weird stuff like, you know, I'm, I'm, all my clothes are all too big. Because the Spider-Clone is actually slightly smaller than him because... Um, Professor Warren cloned Peter from way back when he was in high school Mm -hmm. and right around, you know, uh, amazing 25 or 26. This is even before Gwen Stacy. So the clone has no memory of Mary Jane, except the fact that, you know, she was a a neighbor or Gwen Stacy at all. So then when the clone of Gwen Stacy, which Warren also created, Warren is the jackal, by the way, here's, here's the jackal, um, he created Gwen Stacy because he was enraptured with Gwen Stacy. So you got Gwen Stacy too, kind of running around. And she's so talking to clones like, well, what are we going to do about this thing? And he's like, what's your name again? Gwen? Ah, no big deal. I just have memory holes. I'm still Peter Parker. <laughs> and so he pretty much goes through the whole thing, trying to catch up on this lifestyle that where he's no longer a high school student, but he's an Empire State College student. Um, you know, he... he he doesn't know where things are. His clothes don't fit well because apparently Peter got a little buff between the times. Um, Fighting the Green Goblin will do Yeah, that. and it also shows uh, Marvel time and its proper uh, presence because apparently the time when uh, Peter Parker was in high school up till when Peter Parker was going on, I guess, in 1981, it was three years. It's like, that's a that's a long stretch of issues. Well, to no, if it was three the issues. clone time, that would... The original Clone Saga was like in seventy five. Was it? Yeah, I was. I, I wasn't reading comics at that time. Yeah, I, so no idea. That, that fits pretty well <laughs> with the pretty standard. Uh, one year of in universe time is four years of real time. So this this issue is a double sized thing, and also it came out during the time of Spider Man is Amazing Friends, and that's what they showcased mm-hmm. on the cover of this thing. And check out Spidey. Um, it's double sized. Most of it is Peter going through the motions of trying to figure this out. All the while, the Kingpin is trying to. Get rid of him in classic supervillain style. I mean, we're talking like um, luring him up to the top of a roller coaster so that he can detach a special uh, uh, coaster car. It's got little guns and he chases him like Dr. Robotnik. (laughs) It's classic Kingpin crap. But after a while, 
PD2 finally figures out that he's not Spider-Man. He goes back to the canister where he's got uh, Peter Parker locked up in. And he's like, you know, I could just disconnect everything and be the original Peter because I'm, I'm still a person where I, I could throw this, I could throw you into a, a smokestack or something like that, which is how the original clone was apparently mm-hmm. gotten rid of. Turned to bubbles. But in the strangest thing in happened. Now, okay, if you've never read What If, and you probably haven't even watched the series yet, What If does not tend to end well. Always a bummer. It tends to live leave on a serious bummer. We're going to kill at least half of the people, and whoever went down this dark path is going to regret it. Doesn't happen this way. As a matter of fact, everything comes out super rosy. Everybody lives, and the two Peters decide to be Spider-Man and Peter Parker on alternate days of the week. And that's how it ends. <laughs> okay, you get weekends. That's exactly what happened. Peter says, I'll take Monday and Wednesday. You take Thursday, Tuesday and Thursday. I get MJ. You get Kingpin. He goes, how's, how's that the way to treat your younger brother? The end. <laughs> Great uh, issue. It was one of the first what it, it was the first what if I ever got into, so it really stuck in my memory. Nice. Uh, my number three is a more recent one. This was from about probably four or five years ago, where Marvel did a whole wave of what of what if one shots. Mm-hmm. And there's some pretty good ones in there. I liked the uh, what if Flash Thompson was Spider Man was one of the ones in there. Uh, there's a really good. Uh, oh my god, I'm totally blanking. Uh, Oh, it was uh, What If Magic Was Sorcerer Supreme? Oh, that's a great one. It was written by Leah Williams. I really enjoyed that one. But uh, my favorite of that batch was uh, What If Thor Was Raised by Frost Giants by Ethan Sachs and Michelle Bandini. I don't know anything about that. So Thor, as you can see on this cover, has sick blue skin. He's got a big old chunk of ice for a hammer. Looks awesome. I love it. Love the design. But the premise is basically that uh, when Odin comes to invade... uh, Jotunheim, uh, he gets his shit kicked in by Laufey, and Laufey is then is like, all right, let's follow the Rainbow Bridge. Let's take Asgard. And so they go, and they they basically do to Asgard what he did to Jotunheim. They kill oh, everyone. Wow. And so then, is that the dark ending? or No, this is the dark beginning. Oh, my God. Yeah, they kill everyone. They kidnap Thor and uh, what's Thor's mom's name, Frigga? Frigga. Yeah, they kidnap Thor and Frigga. Uh, they keep Frigga as a prisoner. Thor is being raised by Laufey because he's like, hey, this one's got fight. Unlike my son, Loki, he's just a little chump. This piece of crap over here. And Loki is like, oh, man. He, but he's bonding with Thor, even though Thor is like boisterous and like first trying to like kill the frost giants. Little... This really feels familiar. Yeah. <laughs> he's trying to kill the frost giants, but they're like beating him into submission. He's like becoming a true frost giant over yeah. Loki. Loki, meanwhile, starts a friendship with Frigga, who misses her own son. Oh, neither. Th- I don't believe either Frigga nor Thor know the other's alive. Oh, OK. Yeah. So there's that extra added dimension. And Loki, but Loki knows is friends with both of them and keeps that to himself because he wants he wants both of their love only for him. He doesn't want them to know about the other. It's it's uh, you know, I, I know that sometimes the Loki from the comics feels a really disconnected from the way that Loki is characterized in MCU. Mm-hmm. But that issue makes me wonder if this would actually work in an episode. Yeah, it's good. And the little frost giant Loki is so cute. He's got these little like cool head tattoos. And oh, it's a great design. <laughs> but so Loki is learning magic from Frigga while Thor is becoming a great warrior prince. Eventually uh, killing one of Laufey's generals to prove his worthiness and getting his sick ice hammer that he can smash the shit out of people with. Nice. And uh, finally, they're like going to go. They go back to Asgard where uh, Frigga is being held captive. She's basically been like held in a cell protected by frost giants. The Loki just slips in and out. For a minute there, I thought you said hell in a cell. Hell in a cell. (laughs) (laughs) They threw, threw Frigga three stories off of Asgard to the Rainbow Bridge in 1998. But uh, no, the, they're of course found out, and Thor feel both Thor and Frigga feel betrayed. Uh, Thor, th- well, Thor finds out because he's like, ah, an Asgardian, and blasts to kill Loki, mm-hmm. and Frigga jumps in the way, and Loki's like, you killed your own mom, and Thor was like. Uh, I hate you, Loki. You deceived me. Dark fate. What if shows its ugly head? I banish you to. I banish you to Midgard. And so the ending is that uh, Loki is telling uh, a couple of children like the story of Thor and Loki, 
and like a storm starts overhead. Oh my! It ends with it does end on a kind of like on a kind of a nice note because Thor like leaves Loki this like pendant that Loki had made him when he first became a frost giant. So it's like maybe they can reconcile, but yeah. A true bummer ending, as all what if should have. Yep, yep, because uh, Frigg had to bite the be- the big one for that one. Yeah. Okay. All of Asgard had to die. Yeah. Number two was really interesting to find, and once I found out about its existence, now I need to own it. And it's it's a really old one. This is actually um, what if number nine from like back in 1978. 77, mm-hmm. something like that. Part of that first run, and they got those square bind spines. Yeah, it's basically what if the Avengers were active in the 50s. Uh, I guess this was an opportunity for Marvel to dig up uh, their old Atlas and Timely stuff from and the 50s. And refresh the copyright on. And exactly. <laughs> uh, and try to do something with it. What I had no idea about is this is the this was where the Agents of Atlas came from. Yeah. No clue. And I was like, I don't remember really buying that. Because I, I read the blurb right before I went into the issue. And I was like, it's probably just going to have a couple of the, uh, uh, members. That's all of them. Yeah. Uh, so the human robot, Marvel Man, uh, Gorilla Man, uh, Venus, Namora, and 3D Man, which we obviously never joined the Agents of Atlas. We've got Triathlon. Yeah, we've got Triathlon. And, th- and 3D Man was a 50s era yeah. hero. He was, the, he was the big thing that was happening for Marvel in the 50s. Um, and it all starts exactly like you would expect an Agents of Atlas episode. It's, it's got uh, Agent Wu on the run um, from a character whose when original name we golden are not claw going to say is, golden claw is the uh, the new golden name. claw as he's called um and basically i guess agent wu uh romance golden claw's daughter so there's some bad blood to be had there sometimes you got a mac and golden claw uh does this thing where he kidnaps president eisenhower as one does as one does so jimmy's putting together this team and, and he, he first he finds um uh, do you find no? It was it was it wasn't 3D man. It was oh, I'm losing track of the order. But I don't think it's really it's not important what order he finds them on. But he gets the agents of Atlas. He gets basically the agents of Atlas, and you know he picks up Gorilla Man from Africa, runs into 3D man in New York, and Marvel Man. Um, uh, Venus shows up, who apparently has an interesting power where she turns the weapons of war into weapons of love, Aww. and this is how you get the human robot, because the human robot is out to kill, kill, kill. Uh, when it was created in the 50s, it had its command stuck on kill. So it was killing everybody. It happens. So she got a hold of it, and it was weapons of war. So she turned to a weapon of love, and now it's their friend. That's so and that's how you get the human robot. So they fight these um, 50s era villains, and Marvel really dug 50s era villains. I thought, this is like, this is way over the top because, you know, it's got this big green hairy dude with a hammered sickle on his chest. You got another guy called the Cold Warrior. <laughs> really on the nose of their communist hate here in the 50s, but they showcased on the bottom where these things actually appeared in 50s era Marvel comics. It's like, wow, the Red Scare was big in the 50s. <laughs> so they fight, they fight, they fight, they win. Uh, they release Eisenhower, and Eisenhower's all worried about all this activity might hurt my poor heart. Because apparently Eisenhower was old in the 50s. He had a, had a bad decker. Yeah, so they rescue Eisenhower and the day is won. And this whole thing is being narrated by the Avengers because I guess they had some time to kill. And they were sitting around going, what happened if we were, a, if, the, if the team, the, the spirit of our team was alive in the 50s? And so they go through this whole thing and in the very end, all the Avengers are picking the, 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 um, the if, equivalent of who they there are. There shall uh, there come a day unlike any other. Yeah. So like the beast is like, I like this gorilla man, but I, my haircut's much cooler. <laughs> uh, and the vision identifies, well, of course, the human robot mm-hmm. and Thor with Venus and and that whole thing. And uh, uh, Iron Man identifies with Marvel Boy because his lasers look like repulsors. <laughs> That one was a stretch. That was a bit of a stretch there, Shellhead. Um, but yeah, that's that's what happens. And, and and good on Marvel for taking this team and running with it and probably being one of my favorite all-time yeah. Marvel teams. Good on Jeff Parker for being like, hey, I really like this one what if as a kid. What if I uh what if I convinced Marvel to let me write a few what books if I on polished that? it and turn it into a freaking gemstone? I love I, I love his gorilla man. He's basically just like, what if Sterling Archer was a big monkey? <laughs> 
<laughs> That's exactly what happened too. And when I went to go find Gorilla Man, they didn't realize he was talking. So when they landed and they they, they fought off all these animals or fighting Gorilla Man because I could sense he was something else. And then Gorilla Man's, thanks very much for that, Joe. <laughs> you know, just real 50s man man kind of voice to him. Amazing. And he's like, oh my God, you could talk. You know, in, in typical Ed, Mr. Ed freak out. Of course. It was great. I loved it. I'm, I, I, need, I now need to own this get issue. One. I have to have this issue. So uh, my number two, uh, it's near the end of that volume one run. It's number 44 with a sweet uh, Bill Sienkiewicz cover. And that is, what if Captain America was unfro- was thought out today? But of course, today being the mid 80s. Yes. It's a, a Peter Gillis and uh, Smile and Sal Bashema joint. And this one, so as you can tell by the title, the, the concept is the, the what if where things go wrong is uh, you may remember from the now classic Avengers number four mm-hmm. that uh, Namor found a group of Inuit people worshiping Captain America's frozen frozen body. Yeah. And he was like... He was Bah-r-r-r. all propped up and everything. Yeah, he's like, get this idol out of here and slapped it. And then the Avengers on the trail for Namor found Cap. Well, this time he like took a took a right turn at Albuquerque, so he didn't see them. <laughs> so Cap still was just chilling there, and the Avengers were like, ah, well, we can't find Namor. Better, better try again tomorrow. So Cap stays in the ice. And then we cut to a, uh, a to the modern day, mm-hmm. where which, which at the time of this issue, what year was like, that? Uh, this would have been like eighty four, eighty five, somewhere in that ballpark. All right. And uh, the Avengers are like, well, we don't really have a, a leader to unite us, so we're breaking up. No more Avengers. And Rick Jones is disgusted by this turn of events, as he should be. Someone else is disgusted by these events, and that is a janitor working in a secret military installation, who is seeing the moral decay. Of America, and so he's like, we gotta, we gotta bring back, gotta bring back old time values, and he thaws out Captain America and Bucky, who are in a couple of tubes, and so they go and they start smashing up crime and making a name for themselves and endorsing politicians, but then when they go back to their apartment, it's not Steve Rogers and James Buchanan Barnes, it's a 1950s Cap commie smasher, who oh. the government has apparently kept in a tube. And they're like, well, everyone believes we're the real Captain America, so we'll just lean into it. And so he goes really hard on to uh, investing in, and I'm not making this up, the America First Party, if you can believe it. It's incredibly on the nose. <laughs> it's incredibly <laughs> on the nose. wondering if we were living through Reagan, too. <laughs> oh, my God. So, however, the midpoint is uh, a there's a nuclear submarine Swimming around up north. Mm-hmm. And what do they bump into? But Captain America. All right. We're going to swing around this story. And uh, so they bring him in. And one of the guys, they're like, oh, man, he's been mostly, like, seems like he's been frozen for, like, for a while. But, like, he's pretty much mostly thawed out because he's been, like, in the water. Melting. That's kind of rough. Yeah. And so one of the guys is like, hey, he's dressed up like that Captain America jerk. He's one of those Sentinels of Liberty. Bunch of racists and da 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 da. Wow, Captain America's rep went down to two. Exactly. So Steve like wakes up and he's able to fight him off, and the captain's like, "I knew a guy. Like I remember seeing this guy on the TV when I was a kid. Like this is the real deal." So he takes him back to America, which is now very different ever since uh, Commie Smasher came back. Because, man, oh, it's so it's so pr- prescient. Like it, it's such a <laughs> smart book that recognized already where issues were going during the Reagan era Mm -hmm. and extrapolating on it. So there's like, there's an entire sequence where they talk about the propping up of a free press to give the illusion of the first amendment being maintained. And, but the only, the only uh, newsman who isn't bought out is J Jonah Jameson. Who's because J Jonah Jameson is nothing if not, a pillar a of, of principle. Got and he is secretly yeah. backing and running weapons for the resistance, which is led by Nick Fury, Peter Parker. I knew he was in it. And Snap Wilson. Snap Wilson. <laughs> he never became the Falcon because he never met Captain America. Oh, God. And so they, of course, they see Cap and they're like, hey, it's that jingoistic bastard. Also hysterical. Uh, <laughs> that, the word jingoistic. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, 50s commie smasher cap uh it turns out the backers of the america first party are the secret empire the serpent society and of course uh it wasn't hydra but it was another like 
It was another one of those. Not ultimatum. Groups. No, it wasn't wasn't my boys. <laughs> ultimatum. I could totally derail this whole thing and make you do ultimatum God, don't again. Don't do it. I can't. I can't. <laughs> I'm not strong enough. <laughs> but so the guy, fake cap, is held in a rally. Mm-hmm. Big ol' and a. Uh, oh, also the. Uh, I forgot to mention the resistance's base is in Harlem, which has been walled off by the government. Of course, it has. As a uh, he is constant. Commie Smasher Cap is constantly railing against radical blacks and Jewish bankers. So, uh... God! Prescient. (laughs) Some things never change. (laughs) So... This book would never get made today. No, it pulls no punches. Oh, my God. And who else doesn't? Steve Rogers, who decks the fake Cap while he's given his, like, super nationalist speech. And they're just, like, brawling in this, like... I mean, in the classic Captain America's one cover where he decks... Uh, Hitler on the stage. They don't do a direct homage to it, but they really should have. They really I feel should like, have. And they like he makes Cap makes no bones about calling the guy a Nazi. Oh, that's like, great. It rules. And meanwhile, Cap's uh kind of crappy Avengers, which Hawkeye is the only here, and that bummed me out seeing my boy join up with fake Cap. Mm-hmm. But oh man, this really is. I bet Nick Spencer read this issue. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, 50s Cap went on to become a modern villain, mm-hmm. the great director. Yeah. Who was a flat out Nazi. Yeah. Cap commie smasher, man. Yeah. He wore a white outfit with a red Nazi armband on it. <laughs> that was his shtick. Woo. Wow. And so Cap beats the holy hell out of fake Cap mm-hmm. and gives a speech. And I'm just going to pull it up really quick because I, I got to read it verbatim. Okay. Listen to me, all of you out there. You were told by this man, your hero, that America is the greatest country in the world. He told you that Americans were the greatest people, that America could be refined like silver, could have the impurities hammered out of it and shine more brightly. He went on about how precious America was, how you needed to make sure it remained great. And he told you anything was justified to preserve that great treasure, that pearl of great price that is America. Well, I say America is nothing without its ideals. Its commitment to the freedom of all men, America is a piece of trash. A nation is nothing. A flag is a piece of cloth. I fought Adolf Hitler not because America was great, but because it was fragile. I knew that liberty could be as easily snuffed out out here as in Nazi Germany. As a people, we were no different from them. When I returned, I saw that you nearly did turn America into nothing. And the only reason you're not less than nothing is that it's still possible for you to bring freedom back. Man, that's almost as good as the no you move uh, speech. It's my favorite Captain America speech ever. And oh my reading this issue, I was just like, God, this I'm rules. totally stealing that from you and I'm posting it somewhere. <laughs> it's so good. What if number 44, what if Captain America were f- unfrozen today? Just a masterpiece. Now, while we're talking about what if Captain America uh, covers before we get into our number ones here, um, how about what if Captain America were president and that president really cool Cap. inauguration cover they had for this? That's really classy. I, I mean, as far as uh, covers go, I really love that. There's yeah, if nothing else, like what if gave us some great covers and the the Silver Age DC tradition of what I gotta see that. Yeah, no kidding. Oh, oh God, <laughs> the olden days where uh, Superman and Batman was complete dicks to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> keep dig, keep digging your own graves, Jimmy and Robin. I don't. I have a cl- code against killing, and with Batman with a gun, so I'll do the honors. <laughs> My, one of my favorite covers ever. So while we were going over um, the different what ifs that we liked, uh, I was talking to you about a gemstone that I had recently come across, and I was so flabbergasted that it existed that I was I I I, I needed to get a hold of it. And I thought that I had precious new information, and then of course you told me it was already on your list. So <laughs> we both know what our number one is. If you want to introduce it. Oh, I have my own number one as well. Oh, 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 okay. Yeah. No. Oh, okay, you subtracted it? Oh, yeah, I, I gave- That's a bold I'm statement. I'm giving you the honor. All right. Uh, Casey's number one is, uh, what if number 35, what if Electra had lived? Yes, what if Electra had lived is basically a direct spinoff of probably one of the finest comic books that's ever been written and drawn as far as I'm concerned, which is Daredevil 181. This is like back in 1982. This was a double-sized issue. And the whole the the whole book is great. It's not a part one. It's not a part two. It takes an entire story and sticks it into one book, which is rare for the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, the thing starts off with Bullseye, who's been in prison for a while. I think since 
Daredevil 165 when he completely lost his gourd and thought everybody looked like Daredevil. So he was killing everybody he saw. Great issue, by the way. Um, so he's in prison and he's about to be interviewed uh, on television. And Punisher, who is also in prison in a great non skull uh, shirted cameo, comes up to Bullseye and go, hey, you know, hey listen, I've I found out about some security holes. And I think you should exploit them. And, you know, what Bulls has like, well, why would you tell me something like that? Because I know you'll do something stupid and get killed. Bulls does do something stupid, but survives. But this issue. He gets guy. He gets killed. A glorious full page <laughs> spread of Bulls just getting lit the hell up. So Punisher got his way uh, in this. And Bulls does not go free to find out that Kingpin has replaced him with Elektra. Therefore, kill Electra to replace her spot as the chief assassin. That's the whole point of this whole thing. Um, it's clear to me that this issue came out very soon after that because I they, believe it came out like a month or two after. Like it's because it exists within the issues of Miller's Daredevil. Yeah, which you know this is written and drawn by uh, 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 Frank the Tank himself, thank Frank you. Miller, back when he was talented. And I, I, I will not retract that statement. <laughs> Frank Miller had a time when he was glorious, and now he's not. Not. Uh, but back in the 80s, he was the stuff. And I was going through issues of what if, trying to figure this out. And I saw, what if Electra lived? And I was still going through the idea of, of making a list of what ifs that really came true. Mm -hmm. Because Electra did live, in a way. So I cracked this issue. From and a like, certain point of view. Exactly. And I cracked this issue, and what surprised me is is that this is also written and drawn by Frank Miller. Blew me away. He even, re he even reused one of his own pages, which is that page where Electra's dri driving Foggy Nelson somewhere, yeah. and she's about to do him in. And then she finds out, oh, you know, you know Matt. You remember me. So now I can't kill you because you're Matt's friend. I really, that page is in there. I really love... Uh, the framing device for this story is the watcher telling a distressed, stressed 616 daredevil at Electra's grave. Ah, oh, it's so good. And like, again, it makes it part of Frank Miller's run. Cause this isn't just totally divorced. The watcher going, yeah, check out this weird shit. I saw the other day. It's full on like integrated into Frank Miller's story because hearing this tale of another daredevil, another Electra like gives Matt closure with his Electra, essentially. Which is really strange, considering that Frank Miller's... Uh, yeah, for, I can't screw up his name in my head. Frank Miller's run on this has been completely noir mm -hmm. the entire time. So to, for this what if, I guess in, in, in a way it turns it on its head because he makes this noir what if that has this really upbeat ending if you don't focus on the reality of the real exactly. ending in the real world, 616. And like I don't think you actually ever see Uatu as... Uatu. You just see like a man in a trench coat and a hat who yeah. talks like Uatu and is Clearly the narrator for the story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but basically the, the wrap up um that I'm I'm skipping out on is instead of Bullseye going out to kill Daredevil, not Daredevil, but Electra because she's the chief assassin, it's now Mr. Slaughter and his group of assassins. So he's got like this group of what basically comes down to skilled street thugs. Mm -hmm are now going to go after Elektra and they're just not as good as no. Bullseye. So she, he's magic, <laughs> totally trumps them all. Uh, just clowning them left and right. Oh, God, I really need to get rid of that word. Never use it again. Um, she completely clowns this entire crew of dudes and gets slightly wounded in the arm, finds Matt instead of dying in his arms. Like she originally did in eight, one, eight or one, eight, one. And, uh, well, yeah, well, the issue one, eight, one, um, and so they run off somewhere and live their life on yeah. like some Caribbean island. It's like the ending of the Shawshank after. Redemption. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And everybody's happy until you turn the page and you see that Matt is at Electra's grave and shadowy watchers like, hey, remember that one time? Dick move, you watch your live. Dick move. <laughs> <laughs> but this, I, I, I cannot believe how good this issue is and I have to have it in the collection. It's incredible. So... My uh, my number one is actually the first what if I ever read. And that is a uh, what if volume two, number four, 
Mm-hmm. That is, what if Spider-Man kept the alien costume? Written by Danny Fingeroff, and I be- drawn in what I believe is his first time drawing Spider-Man, like officially, Mark Bagley. Oh my God! Yeah, and you can see traces of where he would go in this 1988, 89 issue. It's really cool. You know how much I love Mark Bagley. You you gotta read it for yourself. It's amazing. So, obviously, the place where we zig instead of zagging is that instead of immediately going to Reed Richards when he he starts feeling weird about the suit, uh, Reed Richards isn't home, and so he goes... (laughs) So basic. So he goes to uh, Kurt Connors, Uh who's like, well, I I don't really know about aliens. He's like, we sit in the MRI thingy. We'll do a CAT scan. And uh, the symbiote feeds off of the radiation from the CAT scan and increases its bond with Peter. God damn it, Connors. And so he's able to see Reed the next day, but Reed's like, uh, this thing is totally bonded to you now. You completely killed this. You the whole situation <laughs> by going to this hack before you go to the smartest man in the freaking world. So they keep Pete in a tube and he's like, and but he's like venom's out and breaks out and going crazy and uh what what the symbiote is looking for is a stronger host because it realizes now having like watched the fantastic four is like oh there are beings more powerful than spider-man here Mm -hmm. and so he finds the hulk and he jumps onto the hulk oh god and as he jumps off of peter parker he leaves behind a desiccated ancient man because he's just been full on feeding off of Peter. I think I've actually heard about this. It now. rules. And so uh Black Cat, the Avengers, and the FF are like, it's okay, Peter. Like, we're you're you're looking better. And he's like, No, I'm dying. <laughs> he's no. Like, <laughs> he's like, that thing ate all my life force and is was powerful enough to overcome the Hulk, who has a big old venom mouth now. Okay, so but I was, was going to ask if this was actually written or drawn after Venom first appeared. I believe, yeah, it would have been like the same year because he's got, like, he doesn't have the wild fangs. He's got those. Oh, he's got big, the proper chompers. He's got the chompers, that, yeah. that, that, uh, He's got the, those. The only good thing that McFarlane ever did. Hey, man, we don't. I'm, not I'm The Todd Father Spider-Man run is undisputed. <laughs> I, I know Heavyweight champion. some of the stuff that McFarlane's done afterwards is yeah, really kind of sold his reputation. He's a complicated man, is what I'm saying. But anyways, so the Avengers are like, all right, what we're going to do? And Reed's like, well, I got this uh, got this cool gun I, I built, and I can like juice it up with using some of Peter's notes that he's been taking and letting me know about, and these tests haven't run on his blood. They're like, cool. So we're going to have to track him and find him. Couldn't be that hard to find a Venom-powered Hulk. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, Pete, as an old man, goes to visit goes to see Aunt May and tell her goodbye. But just like as, hey, like I, I work with Peter at the Bugle and like we haven't seen him for a few days. And I just wanted to you know, let let you know that he loved you. And it's like, oh, wow. Peter's death scene has really taken some time. And yeah. So but as he's leaving, he has a heart attack and dies. Oh, of course. And so the Avengers have a funeral for him. And they're all like, he was our boy. He's a cool dude. Let's go kick Hulk's ass. Yeah. And also at the funeral is Black Cat and the Kingpin. Who... And the Kingpin makes Black Cat an offer. And also, Black Cat's been throughout this issue. Like, okay. She's been like a pretty major player in it. But so they finally track down the Hulk. He's smashing shit up. They they go in. Johnny Storm runs in first. You're done. Get out of here. Uh, they send in Thor, who uh, the symbiote jumps onto him. And he's got this gnarly, like, long black hair. And he's got all his Thor powers. Like, they send in Monica after him, and he just absorbs her into his hammer and shoots her back. How are you not getting off on this, Brooke? <laughs> it's sick. It's so <laughs> rad. And uh, But then they send in the big gun. Okay. And, and by the way, this fight's happening at Mount Rushmore. Of course it is. They send in Black Bolt. Oh, my God. Who just, whoa, just shouts at him, makes Mount Rushmore collapse. <laughs> Hell yeah. And... uh they're like, oh, we did it. We freed Thor. He's okay. And like, well, the symbiote, it's still like, still alive. Let's get it in a jar. And Black, you see a big pew, laser comes out and fries it. And it's Black Cat. And she's holding one of Reed's guns. He's like, but I only made the one. And she was like, yeah, but I like, I'm the greatest thief in the world. I broke in and I stole your plans. And I <laughs> gave, sold them to the one man with the resources and scientists able to replicate it. The Kingpin. Yeah. And all it cost her was that she now works for the Kingpin for life. 
but she did it for love. Oh, zappity zap. There's, there's a great line and speech where she talks about how like, it's like Spider Spider Man like would give his life for all of you, and none of you like would do the same for him. Like you were just gonna let this thing live, like. It, it almost destroyed the world, and y'all y'all wanted to put in a tube and experiment on it. No, like no. someone had to someone had to do Peter Justice. We're gonna be cooking that thing with microwaves. Thank you. <laughs> it's just, ah, it's such a good story. It's a great bummer ending. What if you get to see cool shit you wouldn't get to see in the main universe? Until of course, the, the last few years we've been over venomed. But as a kid, that was cool as hell. Like you never really saw the Avengers and the Spider-Man realms cross over that much. Like, the Marvel fiefdoms were pretty clean cut outside of the occasional crossover. Mm -hmm. Like, Sandman might join the Avengers for a couple issues. The X-Men and Avengers rarely ever saw eye to eye. Uh, Follow us on the Facebook, the Instagram, the Twitter, the Patreon, whatever other socials we got. I can't keep up with it all. No, we can't. Yeah, maybe give us some money. Give us some comments. Give us a like. A subscribe. Tell us a social network that we don't even know anything about. Tell your friends. Most importantly... Have a great week.